anymore. Amen. Amen. I know it's not proper English, but there ain't no grave that can hold me down, and that is awesome, isn't it, if we know the Lord Jesus? Now, I know all of you as parents, when you heard that there was going to be no children in the church, you're like, oh, it means we got to get through a whole service with our kids, kicking, screaming, trying to keep them entertained. So I'm going to do something for you so you can all smile, hopefully not fall asleep because you had a big breakfast. I'm going to invite all of the children to come up and sit around this wonderful fire that we have. I really wanted a real one, but I just couldn't get the deacons to approve it. So sorry, kids, we can't roast marshmallows. But bring your jelly beans if you want as well. And how about this? Can we just give, I know that they don't like to be announced who all does these things, but can we just give a big round of applause to those who built this and this fire and all of that over there in the sanctuary? Did they not do a wonderful job? Amen. Amen. can come up. Doesn't matter what age you are. You're welcome to come and sit. It's not a real fire. See, look, you can even touch it. See? It'll cool you off, though. I thought it was a real fire. No. Nope. Well, I'm sorry. It's not going to warm you up, but it's... it's. Yes. Alright, so let's grab a seat. Now, do you guys all have your jelly beans, too? Because you can eat those if you want to. No, you can't throw the jelly beans in the fire, so let's not do that. It's so great that when you invite kids to come up because you get to see all that they think about. And all they care about is, can I put jelly beans in there and is it going to keep you warm or cold? All right, so if you guys want to, you can look in your bulletins. You'll see the sermon notes. You're welcome to open your Bible to John 21. Or you can just sit back and listen to the story that's going to unfold before these children. And please, don't fall asleep, but if you do... It'll be okay. I've had people do it in other services, so it's all right. <laughs> Just go to Pacific Garden Mission, and you'll have half the audience falling asleep. But it's, it's a good thing. They are tired. You know, guys, do we know the Gospel of John? No. You only know which one? You know John 3.16? That's a good one to know, right? That's a good one. So I'm going to tell you guys an amazing story that's true. You know, today we're celebrating what? We're celebrating that Jesus Christ is risen, right? And the tomb is, is it full or empty? The tomb is empty. That's right. And you know, one of the things, parents, is we think, and also you guys in congregation, is we think about this story that's going to unfold before us. It's one of my favorite stories because it gives such great hope to people who may not know the Lord. And it gives us hope to be able to share with others. But it also gives us as believers hope because we can be restored even when we have a failure. So as we look at this big question, see when we read the text, I know you guys get this sometimes in your Sunday school class, right? You get a big question, you got to try and answer it, don't you? That's right. Okay. So here is the big question that we're going to ask answer today. And it's this. Are we able... To be restored in the midst of our most devastating failures. And though we fail God, can we be restored? You know, we're going to talk about somebody who I really like. And his name is Peter. What is Peter? Who is he? He's a what? He's a fisherman. And what else was Peter? He was a disciple, wasn't he? And did he walk around with Jesus? Yes. Yes. Absolutely. He stepped on the water, too. He's kind of, Peter's a really cool character in the Bible because Peter's one of those, and I know, men. sometimes we do this. We open our mouth and insert our foot at times. Peter did that plenty of times with Jesus. And, you know, there's also times where Peter would step out of the boat, like you said, and walk on the water and not realize that he's walking on water until all of a sudden the wind comes and then he starts to sink. But Jesus does what? He, he helps him, right? Yes, because he knows, absolutely. So our story is going to take place a few days after Jesus has been risen. And he's already shown himself to Mary Magdalene and to some of the disciples. You know that Doubting Thomas character, right? Because he didn't believe. And then we're going to have this great encounter. And I really like it. But I have to give you a little history of why this story is so important. 
Because you know what, guys? Do you know that before all of this, that God and Jesus, all this was ordained. This moment that Jesus was going to have with Peter had been ordained. And this was a moment where Peter really had a great failing, didn't he? You guys know what he did? What did he do? Yes. Amen. All right. You got it. You got the stories. That's good. And you know, that's really what takes place. So Jesus, and I'm just going to go a little bit back for you guys, and I'm going to show you a couple things. So there's a moment where Jesus is about to start calling his disciples. This is three years before the cross. And he comes to the Sea of Galilee, and he sees him, and he sees Peter, and he says, hey, let's set off short. He goes, have you guys caught any fish? And you know what they did? They would fish all night. And they fished all night and they caught absolutely nothing. And the worst time to go fishing is in the morning time, okay? That's the worst time to go fishing. It doesn't work well. And then here's this son of a carpenter because Jesus, is he a fisherman? No, but Peter is, right? So Jesus tells Peter, hey, Peter, I want you to take your nets and drop it off to the right side of your boat. And they catch a marvelous catch of fish. So large that the boat starts to sink, right? And what does Peter do at that moment? He sits there and he tells Jesus, get away from me because I am a sinner. Because at that moment, Peter realizes that he's in the presence of the Holy One, of God. And so what comes after? They go to the shore and Jesus says what to Peter? What does he say for them to do? Starts with an F. I know you saw this, but you're telling you, you got it. Follow. Follow me. And what do they do? They follow him? Yeah, they follow him. Yes. Yes, so they don't know, but they follow him. They drop everything and they follow him. And throughout their ministry, this is what they get to see. They see Jesus heal people that are crippled. They get to see a blind man see. They get to see people that are demon-possessed healed from those things. And they see all these great workings. Even to the point where Jesus starts to tell his disciples. There is going to be a time where I will no longer be with you. I am going to die. And Peter being who he is, and this is a great story of Peter. There's a part in one of the Gospels where Peter says to Jesus, you are the son of the living God. And then he goes just a little bit later and tells Jesus and denies him, doesn't he? Because here's what happens. You know, Peter tells Jesus... I am going to go all the way with you. So all the way to the end, Jesus, I'm following you. I don't care where you go. If that means you're dying, I'm going with you, and they're going to kill me right with you. So what happens? Judas betrays Jesus. And is Jesus arrested? And he's let off, isn't he? And then in a distance, here's Peter kind of standing in the background, just kind of watching what's taking place, not remembering all that was said. And there's a moment where this young girl looks at him and says, Ah, you are one of them. That's right. And Jesus said, and Peter says, No, I don't know him. That's the first one, isn't it? And then, just as they're sitting around a fire like this in the courtyard with the charcoal all lit, staying warm, there's another man that comes to him and says, This is one of his followers because he's a Galilean. And Peter says again, no, I don't know him. Right? Yes. And then the third time, again, somebody recognizes Peter and says, this is one of your men. This is the guy that was it. You were walking with him. And at that moment, Peter says, no, I don't know him. And Jesus and Peter lock eyes. Can you imagine and the rooster what? And, crowing. and the rooster crows, yes. Yes. You know the story well. <laughs> that is a good thing. Good job, parents. That means they know this. But here's the thing about this. If you look at that moment, because yes, Peter realizes that indeed he denied ever knowing Jesus Christ. And he walks, runs away, weeping bitterly because he understands the gravity of what has just taken place. He realizes it. So now that we know that, we're going to come to our story in John chapter 21. 
And you know, it's a morning just like this. And just as the sun was coming up, if you've ever been on a lake and you look out some 300 feet towards the shoreline, you can see shadows, but it's kind of hard to decide who's actually standing there or not. And guess what? They had been fishing all night again. And they've caught absolutely nothing. Yep. And here's the thing. I have to think when I look at this story and I read it, you can almost imagine Jesus standing on the shoreline with a big grin on his face. Because he knows what's going to happen. And he understands all the things that are going to transpire in this moment. And as he's sitting there, he yells out to them and he says, Children, have you caught any fish? This time Peter's response is a little bit better. He says, no, we haven't. And then this is what takes place. Jesus responds back to him. Take your net and throw it over the side. And guess what happens? They catch how many fish? You guys know the number? How many fish? Not 1,000. Not 2,000. How about 153 fish? And as they catch this fish... Here is the disciple that Jesus loves. And he looks at Peter and he says, Peter, it is the Lord. Now, I know all of you would do the same thing that I would do once I heard that it was the Lord. I would take the clothes that I had stripped off because I was working, tie it around my waist, not realize that I'm 300 feet off the shore, jump off into the sea, and then swim as fast as I could to Jesus. Right? I'd probably just sit in the boat and wait till we got back to shore. But Peter doesn't do that. And you know why Peter doesn't do that? Okay, yep. Because he disobeyed him, yes. And he wants to go back, yes. Because here's the thing. You see, when Jesus came to them, Peter shouldn't have been fishing. Jesus called them three years earlier to go become a fisher of men. And Peter's only response to all of this is, well, all I can do is probably go and, and fish. Because how can I ever be used again by God? I disowned Jesus Christ. I disowned him. I didn't even acknowledge that he was the son of the living God. And at that moment, when Peter heard that it was the Lord, he knew that he had to get to Jesus because he knew that Jesus was the only one that could help him prove the guilt and the shame and the remorse that he felt. So you know what happens? Here they come, right? They come up to the shore. Peter's walking up soaking wet. I can imagine Jesus going, this is going to be a nice little cold hug. But, you know, they're there, right? They converse, and here's the charcoal fire. Just like the first time when Jesus was being disowned by Peter. And there's fish being cooked on it. And there's bread. You can think of probably what was going through Peter's mind. The feeding of the 5,000. The fact that he had disowned God around a fire, much like what was there. And Jesus simply says, come and have breakfast. Isn't that amazing? That the son of the living God, the, the son of the universe, says, come and have breakfast with me. And that's what Jesus wants to have with all of us. He wants to have breakfast with us. And they ate a great, great breakfast. Just like we have today, we had a great breakfast, didn't we? And then if you think of this story, I can imagine just as the breakfast is finishing up, the, the disciples are sitting around the fire, and Jesus and Peter are sitting next to each other. And you can kind of imagine Jesus maybe leaning back just a little bit. And he starts to have this conversation with Peter. And I'm probably thinking that at this point, Peter was wondering when this conversation or whatever was going to take place was going to happen. And at this moment, here's where it took place. And you have Jesus and he looks at Peter. And you know what he says to Peter? He says, Peter, do you love me? And this is Peter's response. Yes. You know that I love you. And Jesus says to him, Good. Then go feed my sheep. And then a second time, 
Jesus says to Peter, do you love me? And Peter's response is, yes, you know that I love you. Good, then tend my sheep. And then a third time. Now this time was a little bit harder for Peter. Peter was grieved. It says in the Bible that he was grieved because Jesus asked him a third time. Peter, do you love me? And here is one of the greatest things. We see Peter's response completely change. He acknowledges who Jesus is in his whole deity. He doesn't say, yes, you know that I love you. He says, yes, Jesus, you know everything. And in that response, Jesus simply looks at Peter and says this. Feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. But he goes a step further with Peter because see, at this moment, three times Peter did what? He disowned and he didn't acknowledge Jesus, right? So three times we see Jesus getting where Peter is being reinstated. And at that moment, this is what Jesus then says to Peter. He says, truly, I say to you that you once clothed yourself and you would go where you wanted to. But there will become a point in time in your old age where you will stretch out your hands and you will die. And this is how you will glorify God. Do you guys know how Peter died? Yes. How did Peter die? No. Peter died by being crucified. And Peter felt so unworthy of being crucified the same way Jesus was. He asked him to crucify him upside down. But here's the thing. And this is the whole meaning of this story that I just want you guys to hear. That in the midst of everything that goes on in your life, whatever transpires in your life, there's a point where Jesus says, Follow me. And Peter followed. And that's what Jesus is asking all of us. To follow him. To follow him. You know, if you continue on in the story, we all see where Peter gets to share to the thousands. And I can only imagine that this encounter that he had with Jesus was going through his mind as he was sharing the good news. I can only imagine that when he was being persecuted by continuing to share the good news, all of this was going on in his mind. That, you know what? This is, I'm worthy of this because I'm following Jesus. And I think what's so cool about this story is that we see Peter really for the first time absolutely on fire for the Lord. There was nothing that would ever cause him once again to disown Jesus. And even when they led him to the cross, he would not disown the Savior. So here's what I want you guys to do, because we're going to continue on in this. We're going to do a little bit different now. If I can have you guys quietly go back, we're going to look at some of the implications of this story. Because you know, now that you guys know this, we've got to get your parents to understand a few things, right? And they probably know, yes. All right. So here is the answer to our big question. If you look at it, it says we are restored to our position in Jesus Christ when we acknowledge that we cannot follow him in our own strength. Let me say that once again. We are restored to our position in Jesus Christ when we acknowledge that we cannot follow him in our own strength. You know, as I was reading through this, I was thinking about the different implications and applications. And the first one that really struck me was this. That Jesus is the only one who can rewrite your story. There is nothing that Peter could do to rewrite the failures that he had. He was not going to be able to do enough works. There was nothing that he could do good enough to rewrite that portion. He had to run to Jesus. And I will tell you that that is the meaning behind 
the cross. That even when we fail, even when there's brokenness, it is to point us back so that we run to Jesus. And are you willing to run to Jesus? You know, we look at the second one. It says Jesus calls his people to love and care for others. You know, the encounter that Jesus has with Peter. He challenges Peter. He says, he said to him, feed my lamb. Tend my sheep. Feed my sheep. You know, if we all have a relationship with Jesus Christ, we have all been called to do something. And yes, it's to come on Christmas and celebrate that. It's to come today and to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But we are called to be active in ministry and in serving Jesus. We have all been called to do something. You may have friends. You may have co-workers. You may have neighbors that are around that you need to take care of. And Jesus has put them in front of you to take care of. Some you may go and you just have a, a neighbor that needs help on a regular basis. Are you willing to do that? Because when you do that, then God is glorified. When you do that, we're doing the work of the Lord. When we're here at church, we're called to serve and to do ministry. Are you willing to be one of those? And you look at the application of that. We are to love the church. Peter was called to go and love those who Jesus calls to him. And you see Peter's love. You see his compassion. You see at times when he would call out things and then those who were in need he would take care of. You see even the, the beggar who would ask Peter, do you have any money? And what was Peter's response? I don't have any money but I can give you something better. And that's Jesus. And we can do the same. And here's the other thing. Jesus desires to participate in our lives. But for him to do that, we have to surrender and allow Christ to work. If you look at this story, the reason why Peter was reinstated, it was because he had a willingness to just surrender. He ran to Jesus. He knew what was done on the cross had a purpose and a meaning behind it. And he knew that only Jesus could rewrite his story. But he had to surrender who he was. He had to realize that, yes, I'm broken. Yes, I have failed. And man, when we acknowledge that, look at what Jesus does. He reinstates his people. To do mighty things. Peter was a pillar of the Christian church. That's what he was to be. And in that moment, he must have thought, how could I ever do that? And yet Jesus says, because my death and resurrection have covered you. And you are right with my Father. And I want to conclude with this. But when we come to church on Sunday and we continue throughout our week, follow Jesus. Follow Jesus. Don't follow anything else. Because when you step out of this building and you step into the world, everything and everyone is going to tell you to try and follow something else. Follow this new miracle drug. Follow this. Go after this. And all of that is empty. What Jesus wants us to do is to follow him. And if we are fully committed to who he is in our lives, then we are going to do mighty things. We are going to see transformation like we've never seen before. And I really believe that. I really believe that part of the reason why the church and why even Christians in, in America are so stagnant at times is because we don't take this as its authority. And we don't follow Jesus with all of us. 
We follow Jesus with 80% of who we are. We don't give him 100%. And when he's talking to Peter, he's like, Peter, I just don't want that 10 or 15% anymore. You are no longer a fisherman. You are to go and catch men for the kingdom of heaven. And all of us, when we come to a saving faith in Jesus Christ, are disciples. And we are to go and make disciples. So let us take the opportunities that the Lord gives us as we step out of this church and reach into people's lives. You may be going out to lunch today. You may be going out to dinner. You may go out later this week. Wherever you may be, are you willing to just ask God, help me to see those who are in need. Help me to see those that you're putting before me to share the gospel, the good news with. Because we have an amazing gift in Jesus Christ. We need to be willing to share it. And let us share it with those who do not know the Lord. Because it is an amazing, amazing gift. So would you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning. And as we continue in our worship service, as we sing, as we go forth, may we surrender and just follow you. Lord, there may be some who are sitting here today who are like Peter, who need to be reinstated, who maybe have just wandered away. Or maybe they're not believing who you fully are. Would you draw them to you? And Lord, would you give them the strength to reach out to others who are strong in their Christian faith for prayer and accountability. And for all of us, Lord, that call you Lord of our lives, that acknowledge that, yes, Jesus died on the cross and rose again. May we take that good news and share it with those that do not know you. May we follow you and what you have called us to do. And that is to make disciples. We pray this in the blessed name of Jesus. Amen.